Hello everyone and welcome to Rational Science directly from Frankfurt, Germany. And what do we do here? Well, we're the only site on the internet that does physics. Everybody else, what do they do? Well, they do what they learn in mathematical physics, which is, which is not really physics. They have all these irrational explanations such as black holes, big bang, dark matter, dark energy, and that's only on the, the big scale. On the small scale, it's even worse. Particle can be at two places at once. They have all irrational physical interpretations for even the most common of phenomena. And of course, they cannot explain gravity. What do we do here? Well, here uh, we say that all atoms in the universe are interconnected, physically interconnected. Um, if they're interconnected, then there is no real action at a distance. We see the things that are made of atoms and not the mediators that interconnect them, meaning, you know, the, um, uh, we can't see or touch them. So there is no real action at a distance. Mother Nature does not work with spirits from one atom to the next, which is the way uh, mathematical physics does it, quantum mechanics, etc. <clears throat> Anyways, um, as always, we're going to divide our lecture today or our show today really in three parts. First part, we're going to do a little bit of extinction. I think that's worked quite well. Second part, I'm going to do the uh, lecture on physics. Today we have, <laughs> we have the quantum dot. Whoa. <laughs> and then finally, I'm going to answer questions of those folks who paid attention and asked questions. Even if those questions try to beat me down, you know, anyone can throw uh, rotten tomatoes at me, no problem. I've got very thick skin. <laughs> okay, let's get on with it. Uh, let's do a little bit of extinction. I start with a little question, okay? Are we the last humans on Earth, the last generation of humans on Earth? And what I see around me does not look very uh, promising. <laughs> And let me give you a hero for instance. Here's my uh, dear friend and countryman, uh, Pope Frankie. And it was an article this week says, uh, private, where he says, right, private property is a secondary right. And that must have ticked off all the uh, rich folk, all the conservatives that support him. <laughs> what do you mean private property is a secondary right? And he says, the right to property, it is a natural right, but secondary, derived from the right that everyone has, which is born of the universal destiny of created goods. Aha, uh -huh. so we're all entitled to something, God-given, I guess, you know, because here you have the representative of God himself telling us, okay? The social disasters caused by a pandemic, which has lasted for 15 months, leave too many unemployed and degrading jobs for which a deep reform of the economy and essentially human work are necessary. Uh -huh. And he said that the current job uh, for so many uh, changering workers, for the migrant and the precarious, but especially for so many women, to begin with domestic workers and street vendors, is dangerous, dirty, and degrading. So if you do any of your those jobs, <laughs> you know where you stand with the Pope, okay? And yeah, this comes at the heels of the Pope uh, saying something about also homosexuals uh, a few months back, I think, a couple months back. And that didn't uh, set well with the conservatives either. Uh, he was saying essentially that... Um, you know, uh, we should accept them in the Catholic Church. And partly, part of the problem is that Catholic Church, like so many other churches today, they're losing um, customers. <laughs> they're, they're losing people, you know, everywhere. And uh, in fact, uh, recently we had the Southern Baptists and they had a little bit of a rift and, they, and they're, they're, apparently there's going to be a breakup of the Southern Baptist uh congregation and, and again they're like 14 million strong they've been dropping all these years these last few years and now they might even have a, a split a schism like um, Catholic Church with the Protestants in uh, the 1600s right uh, 15, the 16th century 
So, you know, uh, you got to look at this. You got to um, find out, you know, are, if, if the church is breaking up and uh, church, and I mean all churches for that matter, and, or, and they're losing customers, uh, what effect does that have on, uh, you know, on our notion of morality, family, etc.? Things that have been the, traditionally the, the uh, foundation of society. Okay, we're getting into a world where we go with individuals, okay, and family is dying. Family belongs to the days of manufacturing services. That's a, uh, an individualistic society. And uh, I think this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to see if they can uh, rescue some of the good things that the Catholic Church has done. Of course, uh, I'm sure people can remember all the bad things that the church did as well. And uh, so let's uh, pile up on, on top of this uh, here, the fact that the Chinese empire is expanding, okay? And this is make the, making the United States very nervous, okay? You can see what happened in 1980, 2000, 2020, how the, um, how the Chinese are muscling in on the U.S. empire, okay? Uh, the red zones are where the United States used to have a little bit of influence, but now that influence has been taken over by China. In other words, China is buying them out, essentially. You know, they have money now and they're spreading it around. Meanwhile, the United States is having problem, economic problems, trying to get people back to work. So there's a little bit of difference uh, between what uh, the status of China today and, and the U.S. Okay, and um, now pile up on top of this, uh, what happened this week. Here you have um, Mr. Putin, and he met with uh, Mr. Biden. And th this is what uh, Mr. Putin said after, um, after the show, right, after their talks. Says, there's no happiness in life. <laughs> There's only a mirage on the horizon. Putin called uh, the talks productive, but laid blame for the adversarial U.S.-Russia relationship squarely on the U.S., okay? So uh, it's interesting that he would say there's no happiness in life. You know, uh, I took a college course, uh, macroeconomics, and the instructor the first day came in and he gave a little introduction, and then he said, in this course, I'm going to define happiness as money. If you have money, <laughs> you have happiness. <laughs> and of course, this was a course dealing with money, right? And so um, the question is, uh, Mr. Putin maybe doesn't have money? Is that his problem? <laughs> uh, but I'm sure a lot of you people out there, you know, you would say, well, yeah, I, you more or less uh, agree with that, that, you know, it's money that runs the world. And of course, if you had a lot of money, Man, a lot of your problems would be solved, wouldn't they? <laughs> so in that sense, I guess you could say, yeah, money is maybe a synonym of happiness. And the question is, what happens when we don't believe in money anymore? Uh, will happiness disappear? Will there be no more love <laughs> in the last generation? Is love dying? I mean, you know, it used to be uh, families. They used to have kids. Uh, we can't say they were all happy, of course not, but uh, I guess between church and state and uh, custom and law and whatever, they managed to keep everybody going, you know, and today a lot of that is breaking up, and, uh, you know, everybody has what love for maybe two or three, four years, maybe even less, and then they find new love, and then another new love, and another new love, um, is love dying? You know, it, does the last generation end up with love? Food for thought. Okay, uh, another fellow says along these lines uh, with Putin and uh, and um, Biden says, nuke bombs are fake. <laughs> Hiroshima was uh, reopened the next day. They opened up shop, no problem. Chernobyl and uh, Nevada are safe with no unusual radiation. Well, yeah, otherwise you'd have to worry about going to those casinos, you know. Maybe you should 
hit it instead with the uh, Indian reservations. They all have casinos and maybe they don't have as much radiation as Nevada. <laughs> Believing in, believing in nuke bombs is a religion. Uh -huh. Believing in nuke bombs is not rational. Well, uh, believing is not part of rationality. Believing has nothing to do with uh, rationality. What we do in science is we say we make assumptions to explain something. And you can begin you know, with an assumption saying, let us assume that nukes exist. Now, have you ever seen one of these ICBMs under, uh, silos underneath the ground? Uh, have you seen the person pressing the button other than in movies, right? Have you seen the person pressing the button uh, to test it out or, or where the whole control room is, et cetera, et cetera? Not only in the US, but have you seen them in Russia and China and maybe even, uh, what is it, North Korea? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, um, it all depends on what you believe in, okay? But uh, to think that we did not throw some nukes that, uh, you know, that we went to the oceans out there, you know, Pacific Ocean, and uh, just threw a bomb to test it out, and then other people threw them underground, you know, to say that you don't believe that because you weren't there, you didn't see it. Well, it's more or less like the flat earthers saying that, you know, humans never went let alone to the moon, never went to space. You know, uh, yeah, you can take it as far as you want. Uh, it's more than, uh, uh, more than lack of belief, it's, it's quite irrational, okay? Yeah, we, we have learned how to manage uh, nuclear uh, uh, explosions, manage. Uh, we, we know how to build them, but whether we can manage them or not, well, I don't think so. <laughs> Managing is simply, you know, right now by treaty and it's, um, you know, trust but verify. That's about it. But, you know, if things uh, fall apart around the world, I think they will be pressing the buttons. Part of that issue will be economics. And I think that's the issue, uh, the next issue by this fellow, he says, War is, a, is about resources. Yeah, I kind of agree. Uh, war, like I explained the other day, is, has usually, has always been done for, really, for resources. Even when there were uh, issues such as, um, you know, religious issues, even those uh, were done for resources, for expansion of the empire. And it was one empire against another empire. That's all it was. And so what were they after? Well, they were after resources, maybe compelled the other side to pay tribute, or maybe because of um, access to uh, shipping lanes and commercial shipping lanes and so on. And so, yeah, it's always been about resources, economics. War is founded on economics. That's at least the uh, assumption I make when I deal with issues related to war. Okay, uh, related to last week, uh, person says here, what idiots think we are not animals? <laughs> As a species of life, we need to eat, drink, and have sufficiently socially diversified sex to reproduce efficiently. As long as those preconditions are met, this present species will go on. Okay, yeah, and uh, I think the first two that you mentioned there, eat and drink, that's where we're going to have a little bit of problems. Uh, that's what mass extinction is all about. But he says, who would, who would even say this? Who would even think that we are not animals? Well, uh, someone responds, <laughs> and he says, we are classified as mammals, but there is so much that separates humans from the animal kingdom. Uh-huh. Well, I think uh, this fellow has to define the word animal scientifically in a way that we can use it consistently, rationally, right? And so all he's got to do is define the word animal. Once we know what an animal is for the purposes of science, right? Then uh, we can use this word consistently in any dissertation, okay? So, uh, you know, uh, all he's got to do is define the word. 
then we'll know if a human is an animal or not. And he can't just go back and forth and say, well, um, for the purposes of science, he's an animal. But when I, we talk in our religion and our congregation, you know, uh, at our club, our belief club, uh, then we're going to treat man as separate from the animals. But yeah, you can do that in religion, not in science. In science, you got to be consistent with the word. You're either an animal or you're not, and it's black or white, on and off, on or off, yes or no. There, there's no gray there. You know, you're either part of the animal kingdom of you're not, or you're not. If you're part of the animal kingdom, hey, you got to proceed with that definition so that people can follow your train of thought to say that we're animals, but, but no, we're not, or we're different, or any qualifier that you put in there, well, then, you know, you, you've got, you're only you're trying to protect some religion, that deep-seated religion that you have. Okay, uh, <clears throat> there was an article on climate change this week, and this has to do again with whether we're the last humans on Earth, because we have all these issues out there, you got to be you know, uh, in touch with, okay? It says, from burgers to chocolate to beer, oh my God, uh, how climate change will affect what we eat. Remember, however, the theory is eating. We're gonna stop eating. We're gonna stop eating because there will be no food. That's why we'll stop eating. Not because we want to stop eating, as one guy says out there. No, it's gonna be because we're gonna run out of food. Anyways, the, said, the article said the continued buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere could imperil nearly one third of global food crop production and over one third of livestock production by 2081 to 2100. I cannot even imagine us reaching 2081. I think we're going to uh, disappear much sooner than that. You know, some, some people... Uh, those small pockets that might survive, you know, they, they might reach some age like that. I don't, I'm not even sure they, they would reach that far, but I think they would <clears throat> disappear quite earlier than that, maybe by 2050, 2060, something like that. But this fellow says, or, or this, uh, the guy who wrote this, says um, by 2081 to 2100 in that 20-year that 20, 20 period, livestock production and crop production will be reduced by one third. And he says, there is hope, however, if the world's nations are as successful in their goal of limiting global mean temperatures, it's about climate change, right? To warming between 1.5 and 2 degrees C, the impact on food production will be lessened. And the next thing he does, uh, uh, this comes from a report that was, uh, an article that was published, I think uh, some Norwegians or oh, Finnish uh, published this uh, article in a, in a peer-reviewed journal, and this guy just condensed it, okay? And he says that what will disappear or what is likely to be reduced because of climate change are grapes, meaning he, he did an analysis for wine, and I don't want anyone touching wine, please. I'll die without wine, and uh, says that party might go down as well, and that's beer. Oh my God, they're they're hitting all my weak spots. <laughs> wine, beer, chocolate. I love chocolate. Coffee. I can't live without coffee. I can't live without these things. These guys are saying that this is on its way out. It's slowly dying because they say they will not be able to uh, produce the the uh, plants needed to. Uh, maintain these markets and part of that or a great part of that will be climate change. The climate will not allow the, these um, uh, plants to grow in the regions where they're growing today. That's essentially what what they're saying. Okay, And um, so but but that it didn't stop there. They went ahead and they talked about uh, certain other crops like saying uh, maybe corn and wheat which are very important in the world might have problems and they also talked about some of the nuts that uh, you know some of the trees that especially in California they have the, the uh, uh, certain nuts that might have to be grown in Oregon or Washington state you know but this was the issue the issue is they went into cows they said meat 
Meat and dairy production accounts for 14% of annual greenhouse gas emissions. Deforestation creates grazing land for livestock. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change declared that the prospect of eating less meat could present major opportunities for adaptation and mitigation while generating significant co-benefits in terms of human health. And they're proposing that uh, maybe insect protein <laughs> might replace uh, meat for humans. I'm wondering, uh, is, is this about uh, getting everybody to be a vegetarian or a vegan? Is that what this is all about? I mean, is this just propaganda, some, uh, you know, to, to um, enhance uh, this climate change issue that is so popular these days? Now, I'm going to give you my two cents worth. Uh, climate change, there's always been climate change ever since uh, the Cambrian. We've had 542 million years of climate change. There's been climate changes throughout history. In fact, I don't think the Earth maintained a single climate ever. Now, the, that's not the issue. The issue is the climate that we have right now, we have it for the pro crops that we grow right now. And if the climate happens to change significantly, whatever that means, right? Uh, what does that mean? Are, does that mean that we have to change crops or maybe plant them in the North Pole somewhere? Or, you know, what does it mean? What does it entail? Can we feed eight or nine billion people if there's a climate change? Okay, so that's the issue. And, um, you know, I think there's always been climate change, but I, I, this is my, again, my 10 cents worth, two cents worth, maybe one cent worth. Uh, climate change is totally irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. Uh, people who talk about climate change have nothing better to do or don't understand extinction. And here again, we're talking about extinction. Where I'm saying that uh, climate change is unrelated to extinction in any way, shape, or form. Had nothing at all what to do with it in any age, in any era, in the past, eon. No, never did climate change destroy a single species. That wasn't the cause. Okay, that's my 10 cents worth. The cause for mass extinctions was food. Uh, did food disappear because of climate change? Like, you know, in the mass extinctions, or division, uh, Permian, uh, Triassic, and so on. Is that what happened? Was there a climate change and that triggered the plants to die? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The plants died because they their cycle ran out okay their cycle ran out they became old they lost their genetic diversity there was an overturning of their population pyramid and the animals that depended on them when they couldn't find any more of the food that they were had and they and their ancestors had eaten for millions of years that's when it came to an end climate change had nothing to do with it if anything climate change helps the next generation. When the new species of plants are radiating because the old species are dying, then yes, um, climate does change, help one over another. So I say that climate change has something to do not only with the plants, but with the animals that rely on those plants uh, and where they are on the planet. So if uh, maybe, you know, uh, an animal makes the most of the fact that there's heat wherever he is. Maybe he's close to the equator. He's going to grow big. And the other guy who can't take it as much, he's going to move to more temperate areas or maybe the cold areas. And so you end up, you know, with a polar bear all white up north and you end up with a grizzly, what, in Wyoming or whatever. So, you know, I think this is the way it's done. Uh, by Mother Nature. It, essentially, what, what happens is that climate only, uh, again, it's an idea, it's a proposal. I'm saying that climate only helps uh, the radiation that comes right after uh, mass extinction. Okay, so that's my 10 cents worth on climate change. I think people should forget about it. It's not an issue, a moot issue, totally irrelevant. Okay, at least as far as extinction is concerned. Climate change, even if it uh, 
changes by, I don't know, five degrees in this next century, it's going to go so slow, our economy is going to die a lot sooner than climate change ever happens. Okay, uh, here's the next uh, issue. And again, along the same lines, are we the uh, last humans on Earth? Here we have these ransomware attacks. And this is in parallel with all the killings that are going on, in, especially in the United States. I mean, there's a mass killing every every day. It's no longer news. It's old. <laughs> you don't know if you read the same article uh, or was it yesterday or was it today? Because it's just one guy going out there and killing 10 people or, or whatever. And here we have these other fellows. They do some ransomware attacks using what Bitcoin as uh, the way to siphon the money out. And there's a company, Colonial, shut down 100 million gallon a day pipeline operations. They were providing to the east, okay, and which led to nearly a week of widespread fuel shortages along the east coast. And the Department of Justice ultimately recovered 2.3 million of the 4.4 million. What? Cryptocurrency. Ransom that Colonial paid to the group Darkside. Man, I should really like to be part of Darkside. <laughs> The dark side. Ooh. Uh, and other companies uh, hit with these attacks include JBS, a meat supplier, CNA Financial, and insurance company. McDonald's, the hamburger place. Oh, my God. Hospitals, transportation providers, and even the Teamsters. And this was after Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> after they got rid of him, okay? So, uh, you know, I don't know. You tell me. You think... Um, we're having a little bit of problem with uh, the world? Or is this business as usual? Has there always been problems uh, in the last thousand years at least uh, of this nature? Where there's always been crooks, but you know, Jesse James had to rob a bank and these guys are not robbing banks. What they're doing is using cryptocurrency. They're, they're stealing uh, money uh, <laughs> uh, through the internet. You know, just by pulling out information from a company and then uh, saying, hey, if you want it back, we want a million bucks. Now, how's that for robbing <laughs> and stealing? <laughs> so uh, we got new kinds of crimes going on. And a lot of that has to do with cryptocurrency, which happened to fall quite a bit uh, these last couple of weeks, right? Uh, is that uh, part of the... Uh, demise of money this cryptocurrency is this part of our the death of happiness <laughs> uh, money is going to disappear in great measure because uh, maybe some game that we play with cryptocurrency uh, runs out of uh, out of hand or maybe everybody goes into cryptocurrency more and more and more and well that's a problem for collecting taxes on the one hand could be regulated, I guess. Uh, but is that part of the equation? The last type of money that we'll ever have will be cryptocurrency? Or can you invent a new type of currency that we will use in the next million years? Okay. Anyways, food for thought. I always uh, want to say this, that you should uh, do Extinction 101 before 102 if you want to talk about extinction. What is 101? It's mass extinction. First, you got to show that you're an expert on mass extinction. And then you can talk about extinction 102, which is human extinction. Okay. So, uh, and the reason I put it in those terms is that you need to understand a mass extinction well and understand all the issues there, what died in the past uh, during mass extinctions. And then somehow extrapolate that to man and find out if man can uh, overcome the same mechanism, the same factors that killed the animals in the past. That's, that's my take on that. And then, uh, of course, uh, that's related to this. The uh, uh, question that I put in tandem with that, and that's the homework. And why did the fauna and the seas disappear at the same time, more or less, right, as the animals on land? If you can explain that, well, maybe you have a, a valid theory uh, for the extinction of man. And, you know, you, the, the option is what? Uh, to say that man will never disappear. We will live forever. That's what the religious folk, traditional religions, have been saying 
at least for the last 2,000 years. You will live forever. Okay? Once you die, your soul goes to heaven, <laughs> right? And that's what a lot of these people believe. Okay, let's get on with the uh, lecture today, physics. What's that got to do with? What's got to do with this um, quantum dot? What the hell is a quantum dot? Is, is that something like the uh, geometric point? Is that what that's all about? I mean, here's the geometric point. Is, is that what the quantum dot is? After all, you know, whenever someone says um, in geometry, mathematics, whatever, right? They say, uh, what is a point? And they take the pen, you know, and they hit the paper or they hit the chalk on the uh, board or maybe a crayon against a, you know, a piece of carton there, you know, and, uh, and they'll say, that's a dot. Well, there you see a dot. Is, is that the point? And the point is a dot? Well, there is a difference, you see, because the point, geometric point, as we've covered it recently, right, is zero dimensional. It's zero size, no radius, no nothing. That's what the point is. What is point? It's a location. Is that what a dot is? A quantum dot, right? Is that what a quantum dot is? A, just a location? I mean, they're talking about quantum, right? And we've covered it this week. Uh, the quantum dot, uh, apparently, uh, according to the definitions that are out there, are greater than zero size. But the quantum particles, like the point particles, you know, uh, electron, gluon, quark, those are all zero dimensional, zero nothing. In fact, they're not even particles. What they are is wave function collapses, whatever that means to you. You have an equation that collapses, <laughs> a probability, or I don't know, I, I can't even picture it, and you can't. It's nothing. It's a zero dimensional, no size, nothing. And they do use the word infinitesimal in these situations. You know, they like to use the word infinitesimal because it gives you the idea that, well, no, it's not truly point particle. It's not zero dimensional. It's just infinitesimally small. What does that mean? Well, that means it's approaching zero in size. Approaching is not zero. In other words, approaching zero is not zero, exactly zero. There's a difference. Uh, approaching zero means it still has size, but they use the word infinitesimal, which is very extremely misleading. And why do they do that? Well, they want to give you the idea that it's an observer related issue, that you can't really see it very well. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't see an atom very well, except like from a uh, telescopic uh, uh, view, you know, uh, like an eagle would see it, you know, from far, from far away. We can see atoms like that. We have imaged atoms like that with atomic force microscopes and so on. But to see an atom up front, like one atom with all the little electrons rolling around, uh, never seen that, never filmed that, never been able to image that. And because we can't get close enough, we don't have the resolution to see that. Okay. So the question is the uh, quantum dot the same thing as the geometric point? And the answer is no, because the geometric point, as well as the quantum uh, point particles, they're all zero dimensional. They're, you could say, non-dimensional because they're really talking about concepts, wave function collapse. What the hell is that? That's not a physical object. On the other hand, the quantum dot is used in technology. And so, it, and they don't claim for it to be zero size. So one of the issues you got to think about today, why do they put the adjective quantum? Why do they call it quantum dot if it's, uh, it, it could be a dot, but certainly not quantum. Quantum has to do with, I mean, this could be a classical dot, but not a quantum dot. Quantum mechanics is un understandable. <laughs> you can't understand, you cannot explain quantum mechanics. And... Uh, here, the, the dot, as you're going to see, we're going to be able to explain the classical part, but what we're not going to be able to explain is the quantum part. Okay, so let's move on here. So what is a quantum dot? Here it is. Okay, here's your quantum dot. It looks something like that. Quantum dots, nanocrystals, 2 to 10 nanometers in diameter. 
nanometer is, uh, you know, um, uh, you get a centimeter, uh, millimeters, you get smaller and smaller to micrometers, and finally uh, uh, the ninth decimal point, you get the uh, nanometer. So it's a very small uh, uh, thing, anywhere from 2 to 10 nanometers in diameter. Okay, so what are we talking about? That This is not zero size, obviously. Okay, and so they're saying we got something there. Okay, at least it's defined that way. And they're nanocrystals. So we're talking about crystals, meaning that the crystal is made of many, many atoms. Not to mention molecules. So, so you know, you're talking about something very small, but it is made of atoms. Okay. When exposed to light, uh, quantum uh, dots emit light for uh, of particular frequencies. Okay. So you have, you know, the wavelength and different wavelengths have different colors. And you can also say that different frequencies have different colors because according to the equation, uh, velocity of light C, right, equals to what frequency times wavelength. One goes up, the other one has to go down. They're inversely proportional. So when you increase the frequency, the wavelength goes down and vice versa. And, you know, high frequencies, uh, long wavelengths are, you know, identified with low end of the spectrum, reddish. I mean, for the visible light. And the, uh, um, uh, did I say that right? High frequency is the uh, blue, whereas low frequency is the reddish end, and vice versa for the wavelength. Wavelength, if it's long, it's reddish. And if it's short, it's bluish, okay? So that's essentially what the spectrum looks like. And what these people say is that when exposed to light, these quantum dots emit light of a particular frequency. Okay, so we have the electromagnetic wavelength, you know, which is color, a measure of color, right? Mathematical measure of color is emitted, and it's dependent on the particle size, they're going to say. So it depends on how big this quantum dot is. The higher it is, it's got a different color than if it's uh, low size. Okay, so big size, low size, it changes the wavelength, okay? And uh, it's also precise control of size and what? Shape. So they're talking about size and shape. Okay. And uh, the way they do that is adjusting reaction time and conditions. But we're not interested in the technology. We don't do technology here. We're not interested in that at all. We want to know what is the uh, mechanism that they're going to use to explain what's going on in that micro world subatomic world or even an atomic world if if there is like you know interaction between atoms we're interested in that as well right okay so first of all here again a little more technology how they build these things or how they make them quantum dots are nanocrystals again they're crystals meaning they're made out of many molecules or many atoms okay made by combining metals such as lead and or ca cadmium with other elements including sulfur selenium and arsenic and there on the bottom you have can uh, cadmium sel uh, selenide okay that's one of the compounds that with which they make these dots okay by controlling the ratio of these starting materials the temperature and the reaction time scientists can generate a nearly unlimited number of dots with differences in an electronic property known as band gap. And we'll explain that in a second, which determines the wavelengths of light that each dot will absorb. And my first issue is why do they call them scientists? What's this got to do with science? I mean, these people are technologists. If, if, uh, if that's what they're doing, they're developing, you know, uh, crystals. What's, what's scientific about that? That's like going to the patent office and saying, look, I built this little crystal and I did it by uh, putting all these molecules together and building up this little ball of crystal, crystal ball, <laughs> right? That's technology. What's that got to do with science, with explaining the mechanism of how one of these things works? Why does wavelength have to do with the size and shape? of these nanoparticles. That's what we would like to know. That's what we would like to understand. That's what we would like for someone to explain. And they don't do that. Okay, so this is, this is where we have a little bit of problem with these folks. Okay, uh, here's a, 
um, an illustration of what they just said. You have light coming in and they built these little balls that have all these little layers, okay, of, um, of molecules. These are the so-called crystals, okay? And this is what they're, this is in general terms how it's gonna work, okay? They're just gonna build these things. And again, we don't care about the technology. We don't care how they're built. We don't care what chemical element they use specifically. Not so important. We wanna know the mechanism. Okay, so what is it the me what is the mechanism that these people are going to talk about are going to explain? Well, here's one. Okay, so it's the quantum physical interpretation. Okay, under the influence of light, electrons are excited. Okay, whoa, they're whoo, they're excited, and quantum jump up to a higher energy band, whatever that is. Okay, we'll find out in a second. Electrons can also fall back to a lower energy state or recombine and re-radiate. Okay, so this is how they're going to play around with that. Okay, so what do they mean an electron is going to go up and an electron is going to go down? What the hell are these people talking about? Okay, here we have an idea. Okay, a little more detail. A band gap. What is that? Well, you have two things. You have the conduction, uh, the, let's start at the other. You have the valence band, which is the outer layer of an atom. It used to be, at least, in my days. But uh, from there, it moved, the electron can move to the conduction band. And the question is whether the conduction band is part of the atom or part of the flow of current. I mean, does the electron stay in the conduction band and keeps whizzing around the, the atom, or does it fly away? Okay, so this is important because they talk about the electron jumping up uh, because, you know, you hit it with energy, you hit it with this uh, photon, this uh, ball of light, it imparts energy to the electron. The electron now moves from the uh, valence band, outer electron, outer orbital of an atom. This is the outermost orbital, and it's going to move it into the conduction band, whatever that is. What is the conduction band? Does that mean that now the we have a higher level of um, energy there that the electron continues rolling around the atom in the conduction band? Or does it fly away and become, become part of another atom? Does it flow, uh, you know, electrical flow is what? The flow of electron beads, right? So what, what happens to that electron? Okay, does it stay there? Well, this is the band gap, which is the difference in energy levels mathematics, nothing to do with physics. This is just an accounting procedure here between the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band determines the wavelength of the emitted light. Okay, so you can see that there's a different uh, energy, that so-called energy, which is what? It's, it's light coming in. It's a photon. Why they draw it as a wave, I have no idea because I thought the, the, the photon, you know, uh, when it hits uh, the surface, in this case, it hits an electron. Very good um, uh, accuracy. It, it just hits it right. I mean, in electron B, we can't even measure. It's pinpoints nothing, right? And here we have a photon, which is another nothing. And this nothing hits this other nothing, bumps it off into a higher, into the conduction band or a higher energy level. Okay, that's, that's the explanation. This is, what their, this is their physical interpretation. And uh, here's a uh, little uh, GIF on this uh, showing you, you know, the differences. In an insulator, the band uh, gap is too big, too large. And so it's very hard to knock an electron from the outer valence uh, level to the conduction band. Second conductor, a little easier. How about conductor? Well, conductor, essentially the conductor, uh, the valence band and the conduction band are one and the same. Okay, so they're uh, like iron. Iron is, has conductor uh, and valence bands are the same. And here you can see it. Yeah, you know, you see how uh, with a little bit of energy, you knock uh, electrons from the valence band into the conduction band, and now they're going to start flowing. Okay, you'll see this in a second. Here it is. And you can see the electrons are flowing. So they don't stay in like in a conduction band around an atom. They start flowing. They start flowing, and that's what we call electricity.
you know, the flow of electron beads. And you say, well, what's wrong with all this, Bill? It looks like a sound theory, you know? One would think it's, it's okay. You say, look, you got a little bead. It's going around the um, outer shell, obviously, of, because we're only talking about the valence band, uh, the outer shell of an atom, okay? Irrespective of what atom it is, it's the outer shell. You hit it with a little bit of energy, meaning a photon, meaning a wave, whatever that is. You knock it into the conduction band. Okay, so now this little bead is in the conduction band. Now it's going to flow along the conduction band. And that conduction band is what we call electricity. Nothing wrong with that. But what happens? Because the difference in between the conduction band and the uh, valence band it depends on what that distance is. Well, you have different colors of light because the color of light is dependent, the wavelength, frequency, if you will, uh, is dependent on that distance. Okay? And for conductors, obviously, that's uh, much easier because the, there's one uh, conductor and valence band are one and the same, essentially. Okay? okay, where do we get all this nonsense from? Well, we got it from, from this. These are the notions that we have of the atom. It's the planetary atom that you see, and these are two different atoms that I found on the internet, and they essentially put the same thing. Everybody's using the planetary model to explain this. And so what is the planetary model? Well, as you can see there, it's, um, it's got these circles, and those are the energy bands, okay? Those are the orbitals, meaning that it is an orbital an orbit, uh, not quite. It's, uh, it's like an orbit, but it's a region within which you can find the electron orbiting. <laughs> okay, that's the best way to explain it. And that's what you're seeing. You're seeing a cross-section, in other words, a two-dimensional uh, vision of what an orbital is. You're supposed to see this or imagine it, visualize it as a shell. Okay, but the shell, what is the shell? The shell is the... Um, orbital and the orbital uh, you think of an orbit because you see the beads going around it actually no because the bead is one thing and the orbital is another the orbital is where the electron is trapped within okay so the electron is trapped within the orbital it cannot leave the prism okay and it can move around in a region with within the orbital but it cannot uh, fall to the uh, lower orbital. Every electron is out there in, in his own orbital, okay? And again, we have zero dimensional electrons in their own orbitals, <laughs> okay? So these are the physical interpretation. And where do we get this nonsense? Well, we get it from these two gentlemen, and it's, one is Bohr and the other one is Rutherford. This is where the planetary model came. Uh, Bohr, in, what was it, 1911, he came up with the um, orbitals, the notion that an electron can fall from one energy level to another and back up, and when it does, it emits a given frequency of light or a given wavelength of light. So that's where this quantum dot got the idea, you know, that uh, electron is a bead that just falls from one uh, energy level to the next, up and down, and when it does, it emits light. And the uh, frequency or wavelength of that light is dependent on that gap on that distance between energy levels. What did Rutherford come up with in 1919? Actually, he finally inferred it a few years later, but he said, look, this is the nucleus. And the nucleus is the center of the atom. And it, uh, at the time he was thinking of maybe just a single proton in there. But here you have protons and neutrons, which uh, came a little later. Chadwick came up with that idea, James Chadwick of the neutron. and so one came up with a nucleus and the other guy came up with the orbitals and they put them together and that's the planetary model that we have today that everybody uses to explain among other things the quantum dot okay because what is it that we have to explain about the quantum dot well we have to explain the wavelength why uh, this quantum dot emits different colors okay why when you build it, when you make this technology, whether it's for screens or whatever you're going to use them for, why it is able to emit. And remember, it's not reflecting. It's really emitting different wavelengths, uh, meaning different colors. Okay, That's what it does. That's 
that's the value of it. Technology, hey, love it. Uh, science, where is it? We don't have any science yet. Okay, we don't have any explanation. And you say, well, why don't we have an explanation? Well, here, here is the, the problem. Here's the main problem that these people have to explain in a nutshell. The first one is, why doesn't the electron fall to a lower uh, energy level to automatically? Why does it continue falling all the way down, in fact, to the proton? Isn't the electron negative, whatever that is? Isn't the proton positive, whatever that is, in physical terms? If we have negative and positive, uh, I thought that negative attracted positive, positive attracts negative. Why doesn't the electron fall to the center of the nucleus where you have all these positive charges known as protons? I mean, it's a very simple question. Why doesn't it fall in there? And they never answered that question, which was one of the reasons they came up with a planetary model. And what did Bohr answer? Well, he said, it is so. He took his uh, uh, magic wand, which I don't have here for a second. Uh, do I have it here? He took his magic wand and he says, it is so. And he was able to explain uh, the spectrum of hydrogen because of this. But yeah, I mean, uh, mathematically. But you still have not explained the physical process, the mechanism. And so, I mean, why doesn't the electron fall to the proton? Then you have the other issue. Why doesn't the electron go outside of the orbital? Why doesn't it fly away? So you have these two situations. Why does the electron stay within a given band? Energy band, energy gap, whatever you want to call it, I don't care, orbital. Uh, why does it stay in that, in that lane? Why, why doesn't it go outside the lane, you know, and get a nice cream cone uh, before it continues running? Okay, so it doesn't fall out of the energy band, orbital, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't fall inwards to the proton or nucleus. Why? What's, what's preventing those two situations from happening? That's what we don't have an answer to today. And they never will. They will never will. Why? Because you cannot explain it with particles, with discrete particles. That's where the problem is. Now, uh, here uh, we can explain it maybe by showing a construction, okay, of uh, our version of that atom. And maybe I should put them side by side. Here's our uh, uh, atom. Uh, here's, let's see, where was this? Yeah, here's the other one. Let me put this one over here. And this one over here. So this is their model, okay, the planetary model. And you can see our model, the one we're proposing in exchange and why uh, we are able to explain these things, such as quantum jump and why we have certain frequency and wavelength. Because, you know, it, every atom in the universe is bound by what we call the electromagnetic rope. Binds any two atoms. There you see the construction of the atom on the bottom right. Okay. And uh, one thread of the rope forms the electron shell, which is uh, encapsulating the proton star, which is made by arbitrarily the electric thread. Okay. And so the, the rope becomes an atom and the atom becomes a rope and so on down the line. Forever. Now we can explain why when the atom expands and contracts, it uh, emits light, frequency, wavelength. Why? Because it's uh, the link of a rope. See, they cannot explain that. They cannot explain why the atom doesn't fall to the center of the atom. We can because, see, the balloon just expands and contracts. There is no, the, the balloon does not collapse completely to the center of the atom because it's got all these uh, I call them, uh, I mean, you can think of it as a rolled up urchin, sea urchin, all the, or maybe uh, a porcupine. You know, the, um, all the quills are pointing outwards. And so the shell can only go so far back and forth. And what it does is just pumps back and forth. Okay. So it cannot collapse the electron shell all the way to the center of the atom. And when these people are talking about an electron bead, what they're looking at is one of the points, a location on the electron shell. That's what an electron has been all these hundreds, this hundred years, these past hundred years. 
Okay, so you can see there's a difference, but see, we can explain action at a distance with this, which is one thing that the quantum model will never be able to explain. How does this particle over here influence that particle over there? How do you do that? This is the issue. And he cannot explain that. That's why they cannot explain gravity. Gravity, they know, they realize uh, intuitively it's a pull force of some kind. How do you pull with particles? Okay, you got two particles, okay, uh, here, okay. How does particle pull on that one? Now, if they're connected, you know, by something you can't see or touch, now we can see why, you know, uh, I mean, at least you can now imagine pull, okay, because uh, that there is a mediator. The only issue is that we cannot see or touch that mediator. And so there is no real action at a distance, just we can't see or touch it, okay? Okay, um, what can we conclude from uh, this? Well, here, here's the conclusions that I reached. Uh, the quantum dot is infinitesimally small, okay? Why do they use infinitesimally? Why do they talk about two nanometers to two to 10 nanometers? Well, they want to give you the idea that you can't really see them. They're little crystals, so tiny, you can't see them. So they're infinitesimally small. And they don't worry about the problem anymore because mathematicians, so-called scientists, they don't care about architecture, shape. They don't care about size, okay, meaning something greater than zero. And, and that's sense size. And so they use the word infinitesimal to refer to these things. Why? Because the observer cannot see it. Now, they do need shape and size because um, on the one hand, it's immaterial to them. But on the other hand, uh, shape and size are what make the uh, quantum dot useful in technology. Remember, shape and size of the quantum dot that's going to determine what color wavelength it emits. Okay, so... Uh, we're not interested in technology, we're not interested in that part, we're interested in why does it? And these people are saying, well, it's related to shape and size. Okay, how is it related to shape and size? Why? What causes shape and size to change the wavelength or the frequency? That's what they have not answered. That's why they're not scientists, they're just technologists, people who are developing stuff without seeing, you know, they're blind. Okay. Q, uh, quantum explanation, but is it electron jumps from valence to conduction band and back? Yeah, but see, in order to do that, they need uh, the irrational planetary atom. Okay, and so they say different sizes and shapes of dots mean different wavelengths. Yeah, and why? Why? If they're going to use the planetary atom, they can only describe it mathematically and say, well, this is what happens. This is what we measure. But they cannot explain the process with discrete particles. Okay, so no, uh, quantum dots are technology, not science, and the fact that they use quantum, the adjective quantum, that they put that in front of it, is very misleading, because people approach you and you'll say, well, hold it, uh, quantum is irrational, blah, 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 and they'll say, well, no, but we have quantum computers and quantum dots. And they use that word quantum, they think they're talking about science. You say, well, okay, so we have quantum computers and quantum knowledge. Yeah, you wouldn't have a computer if it weren't for quantum. But see, they, they don't realize that computers are classical objects that we can see and touch and manipulate, etc. It's what we're trying to figure out is what happens at the uh, genuinely uh, genuine quantum level. In other words, what happens at the atomic and subatomic level. That's where, we, that's where we're stuck. That's where we can't get an answer from them. So if the computer works, it, would be, it works because of transistors, not because of quantum. Quantum is something else. Quantum has all these weird explanations, physical interpretations for what happens at the subatomic level, at the level of light or gravity, which they cannot explain. Okay, That's where, that's where quantum uh, that's where quantum really, that's its realm. Not here, not at the classical level. And this so-called quantum dot is a classical dot because it's, it's a crystal that has size and shape. None of the particles of quantum mechanics has size or shape. If you don't believe me, just go to a standard model and tell me what an electron looks like. Do, do you see a 
a shape there in the standard model do they have a nice little picture especially when the Swedes uh, I think uh, university or they wrote a paper showing that they were able to film an electron good you film an electron you should be able to give tell me what an atom looks like and what holds the electron to the atom and you cannot say that the electron is zero dimensional point particle if you filmed it okay so this is where the problem is quantum dot does not belong to science it belongs strictly to technology and it should be called a classical dot <laughs> okay let's move on to the questions okay here we have the first one fellow says says uh, tubes of force this is faraday's notion of electricity uh, the, the only problem is force is a concept. And so uh, what do we have? T tubes of love, tubes of intelligence. Uh, what, what is this? What kind of tube is that? So yeah, uh, Faraday uh, could use any words he wanted because he wasn't able to visualize the invisible, intangible entity that was mediating, for example, magnetism. He could not see him. He could do experiments say oh you know i can attract all these iron filings i can do all these fancy things with magnets yeah those are the visible part that's the classical part what about the invisible quantum part okay and you cannot use terms like tubes of force because uh you either talk about tubes or about force and if it's a tube of force you're really talking about force and force is a concept so yeah you got a good old uh faraday has to come back and tell us what he meant by force, okay? a tube of force, especially. Okay, uh, another question issue, fellow says, we can't see, touch, or measure these ropes. Yeah, okay, but they are objects because, what? They have shape. Yeah, correct. Irrational. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, let's find out if it's irrational. Um, what we got to do in science is define okay we have to define what we mean by an object and so yeah it's easy to say but hard to do what what this all said you know it's see touch can't be used consistently and uh in other words rationally uh it is irrational why because you can see there just an example i gave a couple of times already uh you can't see the klingons uh table he's on the other side of the universe in a planet roaming around there you can't see or touch it. So is his table an object? I mean, according to the criteria, if we're going to use see and touch, we can't see or touch it. So yeah, this fellow has to define. All he does is repeat himself all the time. He's not, he's not answering the question. He's running away with his tail between his legs. All he's doing is religion. He's repeating over and over and over. Oh, it's see, touch, it's see, touch. Yeah, tell me why. I mean, uh, how can we use see touch in this uh, context? If I can't see the uh, China man's um, table on the other side of this uh, planet, that means that his is not a table. Uh, his table is not an object because I, I can't see or touch it. It's not an object for me. It's an object maybe for him and maybe when he's at work he can't see it either so it's not an object for him. It becomes an object when he comes home and he can see and touch it again. I mean, you know, what the hell is this? Now, you can't use this uh, C-Touch criterion. And um, let me double up on that. Uh, uh, here is uh, a criteria for irrationality because you said it's irrational. Well, okay, what do you mean by irrational? Let's define irrational. See, and we do define irrational, uh, treating concepts as objects, Okay, reification, concretization, uh, using inconsistent definitions or undefined words, which is what this fellow is using. So he is irrational, not us. Uh, if he wants to be rational, uh, put a definition that you can use consistently. Then you'll, you'll show us that you're rational. And again, you've got to define the word rational or irrational, one of the two, so that we know what you mean when you say it's irrational. You can't say that irrational is anyone who doesn't agree with you. <laughs> no, that's not a very uh, objective definition. Now, you have to define the word irrational if you're going to use it. 
And yeah, I took the trouble of defining all these words because I knew those are the weak points of mathematical physics. They have not defined object, they have not defined what exists means, and among other words, they have not defined what irrational or rational is or means. Uh, they just say, oh, you're irrational, we're going to call you a crackpot, a crank, and they leave it at that. No, no, uh, maybe you're the crank because you have defined the word irrational, and so we don't know what you mean when you say that I'm a crank, I'm an irrational individual. It's the other way around, okay? Theory is it consistent with or doesn't follow from the assumption. Those are the three main ones, and what mathematicians do is they describe, instead of explain, they call it a, a theory. Not a theory, a theory is an explanation. And then you have the uh, mechanism, uh, assumption doesn't work or cannot even be imagined, okay? And so, uh, yeah, uh, those are the criteria for, uh, for what we mean by irrational. And if you don't like it, no problem. Get on, uh, 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 you know, get your sword and shield, get in the ring and defend your definition, whatever definition you have for both object and for rationality or irrationality. Okay, uh, fellow says, says the scientific method, and he goes through this sequence. He says, make an observation, ask a question, okay? Form a hypothesis or testable explanation. Is that what a hypothesis is? Testable explanation? I thought it was a prediction. A prediction is a description. Uh, and so, you know, an explanation is not a prediction, is not a description. So no, a hypothesis is not a testable explanation. They have so many definitions for hypothesis that people bunch them all up and say, well, all of that is a, is a hypothesis. No, a hypothesis is an assumption, and the assumption includes the objects, the um, uh, definitions, and the initial scene, the first few frames of the film that set the framework for what you're going to explain. Now, make a prediction. Test the prediction. How are you going to test the prediction? You go to the future, I guess, <laughs> and iterate. Use the results to make new hypotheses or predictions. Okay. Okay, and uh, what do we put against this? Well, we put the, well, here, here's the mathematical method, mathematical method, which is what he just explained. Okay. Here's in a little more detail. I put this up the other day. Uh, what he's saying is you make an observation. In other words, you gawk. Yeah, you gawk, observe something with your drooling mouth wide open. Then you have to gawk again, okay? Repeat the observation. Then you prophecy, okay? You make a prediction. Test your hunch with an experiment, which is what this guy says. You make a prediction, you test the prediction, okay? Uh, measure, calculate, do some math. He didn't put that in there, okay? You got to do all that stuff in, in the religious method or the mathematical method, okay? You propose the most ridiculous physical interpretation you can imagine. Otherwise, it won't be accepted by your peers. Yeah, you get it. Because otherwise, if you propose something rational, they say, what do you think you are, God, that you know it all? So no, you got to propose an irrational explanation. They'll believe that when they say, okay, uh, maybe they'll believe it because it doesn't compete against them. <laughs> uh, they say, well, we all have irrational explanation. Yours is just a little more irrational than mine. Okay, great. Uh, maybe that's the criterion. But yeah, you got to come up with the most ridiculous physical interpretation you can imagine. Then you sell it to your peers, okay, high-priced individual, uh, and ask them to give you a medal. And then you, if you do get a medal, then you can censor and treat us cranks and crapbots, all those who are skeptical of your proven theory. Okay, that's the method that is used today. And I guess that's the one this guy's defending. Okay, and here's uh, the real mathematical, uh, the, I mean, the real scientific method against the mathematical method, okay, side by side, so you can see the difference, okay, the scientific method, um, step one, objects, definitions, and initial scene, or first frames, and that's known as the assumptions, or hypothesis, okay, and then the theory is based on that, because what, what are we going to do, we're going to give you a rational explanation of a mechanism in physics, okay, and so, uh, those are the primary two, mechanisms and causes. Okay, so you can see there's a difference between what this fellow proposes and a genuine scientific method. What do we need the scientific method for? Well, we need it to explain a mechanism, which we don't have today. We don't have explanations officially for gravity, none at all. Uh, they do have one at the macro level, uh, general relativity, uh, and that one is essentially, essentially, 
irrational. Why? Why? Because they're saying that space-time, which is a concept, bends. And that's the notion that they have of gravity. Uh, why does it bend? Well, because a force pushes the ball down against space-time, meaning they invoke uh, good old Newton, which they say general relativity does not rely on forces. You, you figure it out. And that's uh, in general relativity. In quantum mechanics, they don't have uh, any explanation for the force of gravity. And then, other than that, uh, all the other explanations are irrational. You know, a particle can be at two places at once, there are parallel universes, and whenever, you know, uh, you don't peek in the box, uh, Schrodinger's cat could be, is, not, not could be, but is in all universes simultaneously. Um, multiverse. <laughs> so the cat goes off into all these different places, okay, simultaneously. So in this universe, the cat died. In that other one, he's still alive. The other one, he's playing poker, maybe. Who knows? Or becomes Garfield, or <laughs> a cartoon character, okay? So yeah, uh, the big problem we have right now is that this uh, method that this fellow uh, put up there, uh, it's, it's not scientific at all because all it does is create descriptions and, you know, maybe it's uh, used for technology, more power to them. But that's not science. That's technology. That's got to do with gadgets, de uh, developing uh, gadgets by trial and error. It's got absolutely nothing to do with science, with explanations of mechanisms. And with that, I will see you on Wednesday. And so, yeah, ask your questions.